بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره نعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان احسن الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان شر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار so in the previous lessons we were touching upon the topic of allah's names and his attributes and we discussed the statement in the line of poetry wa jami'u ayati sifati umirruha haqqan kama naqala at-tirazu al-awwalu which translates that all of the verses of the attributes i pass them on i pass them on in truth just as the very first generations transmitted them or conveyed them and so we explained in the previous lessons uh, what happened in the second century after hijra when the ahlul kalam they appeared and they began to speak about allah's names and his attributes based upon a foreign language a language foreign to the quran and to the sunnah and we discussed some of the issues connected to that and so today we're going to begin the next line in the poetry and we're going to remain upon that discussion we're going to remain upon the discussion that we had in the previous lesson and we want to try to finish this discussion off before we move to the subject of the quran the quran and allah speech specifically so here in the poetry shaykh islam he says in the next line the eighth line now wa aruddu uqbataha ila nuqaliha wa asunuha an kulli ma yutakhayyalu now this translates as that i refer to the understanding of these texts right so the speech is still to do with the, the the previous line that whatever you pass on from the sunnah whatever you convey from the sunnah exactly as it was was conveyed by the salaf then you return the understanding of those affairs those matters which are in those texts meaning allah's attributes that you refer their understanding to those who transmitted them I'm meaning here the sahaba and the tabi'in because they are the ones who conveyed the sunnah of the messenger of Allah and within the sunnah of the messenger of Allah we find the narrations pertaining to the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when they conveyed them they conveyed them in a manner in in a way that they knew that this was how they were understood and this was how they were revealed to the messenger of Allah so in other words a muslim this is what sheikh islam is saying that in my understanding of those texts then I refer, I refer it back to those who conveyed and who transmitted those narrations and inshallah in a short while we will read some of the statements of those imams who are being referred to by this statement here by sheikh islam when he says i refer them back or their understanding back to those to the nuqal nuqal are the transmitters and so we'll read some of their statements inshallah ta'ala some some of the imams of the salaf from the second uh, century then he says wa asunuha an kulli ma yutakhayyalu that i protect them i protect these narrations from everything that is imagined that a person may imagine in his mind with respect to the attributes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so a person he protects these narrations from all that, that 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 can be imagined so this is the line that we are going to focus on today inshallah ta'ala for the rest of this lesson and so the key thing that we want to bring out from uh, these two halves of this line of poetry is as a muslim how do you protect your understanding from that which is wrongly imagined about the attributes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what are the foundations what are the usul the foundations that our scholars of ahlus sunnah have laid down that allow us to implement what is mentioned in this in this poetry to protect this understanding 
from everything that is that is opposed to it, from what the mind may imagine. So first of all, Sheikh Salih al suhimi Hafiz of Allah Ta'ala, he just has a very brief commentary upon this uh, poetry, so we'll begin with that first. He says, وَأَرُدُّ أُحْدَتَهَا وَأُقْبَتَهَا He says, this means that I return the meaning, the meaning of what is in these texts. I return it back to those who transmitted these texts with truthfulness, with every truthfulness and trustworthiness, with amana and with sidq. And we do not go beyond what they were upon in terms of having faith in these narrations and having faith in the specific meanings, the actual meanings upon the way that is befitting for Allah the Mighty and Majestic. So therefore we do not فَلَا نُكَيِّفْ We don't start asking how. How are the attributes of Allah? وَلَا نُمَثِّلْ nor do we make tamthil, nor do we make a likeness between what Allah is described with and what we find the creation described with. Wala nu'attil. Nor do we deny and strip Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of these attributes. And nor do we go beyond their positions. We don't move beyond their position, either to the position, either to the extreme of exaggeration and nor to the other extreme of neglect, or falling short. So don't exaggerate, and fall into tashbih, likening Allah's attributes with those of the creation. Nor do we fall into neglect, and deny for Allah what He affirmed for Himself. So with this affair, this is the balanced position of Ahlul Sunnah, in between the mushabbiha, those who liken Allah's attributes with the attributes of the creation, and nor with the mu'attila, those who deny Allah's attributes. So therefore they are balanced, Ahl Sunnah are balanced in this topic of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in between the mushabbiha, those who liken Allah with His creation, and the mu'attila, those who deny His attributes. So therefore, this line of poetry, what a person is really saying by this line of poetry, is that I do not move away or change from the way of the Salaf, in the topic of Allah's names and His attributes. And so therefore, I affirm for Allah, I affirm for Allah, whatever Allah affirmed for Himself, and whatever the Messenger affirmed for Him. And I deny from Allah whatever Allah negated from Himself, or whatever His Messenger negated from Himself. And I do not move away from, from this foundation, which the Salaf were upon. This is the end of the speech of Sheikh Salih al suhaimi And so from, from, from this speech, we pick out a key point and a key principle. And a person who merely reflects on this principle, he knows that this is the truth. It has to be the truth when it comes to speaking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is that on the assumption, which is a correct assumption, that Allah is most knowledgeable of his own self. Allah is the most knowledgeable of his own self. And likewise, Allah's Messenger is the most knowledgeable of all of the entire creation with respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And further, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given safety to the messengers in their speech. That when they speak about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the speech of theirs is from revelation. And Allah has protected this speech. And by way of this speech, Allah has intended guidance and direction for mankind. Upon all of these foundations, when we hear this principle, and when you, when you say this principle, and when you express this principle, that I will not affirm anything for Allah, I will not say that Allah has such and such a name, I will not say that Allah has such and such attribute, I will not say that Allah has such and such action, until and unless... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has himself affirmed it for himself or if his messenger has affirmed it for him and likewise on the other side I will not deny for Allah I will not negate for Allah I will not say that Allah is not like such and such I will not say Allah does not have such and such attribute I will not say Allah I will not say this until and unless I see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has specifically negated and denied that thing for himself 
or the messenger has negated and denied that for himself. This principle is the is is the principle that distinguishes Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'a from all of the people of Kalam, Ilmul Kalam. Because because you can see that this principle is founded upon the revelation. The revelation. It is founded upon what Allah has revealed. Whereas the what the Ahlul Kalam, what they refer back to, they refer back to whatever agrees with the intellect. They use the intellect, reason, as a foundation. Right? It, it clashes with this principle here that we hold on to as people of the Sunnah and the Jama'ah. So, that's the Kalam of Sheikh Salih al suhimi And moving on to the next commentary. So, the meaning here then is of this first half of the poetry, وَأَرُدُّ أُحْدَتَهَا أَوْ أُقْبَتَهَا إِلَى نُقَالِهَا I refer its understanding back to those who transmitted it. This means that with respect to all of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we go back to the fahm, the understanding of the salaf. The understanding of the salaf. Because the salaf, they are a'lam, they are the most knowledgeable, and they are ahkam, they are most precise, and uh, they are the uh, aslam, most safe. Their way is a'lam and ahkam. It is the most knowledgeable, and it is the most precise, and it is the most safe. Their way is safe from any corruption. And this is not, not so with those who came after them. Those who came after, then their understanding became tainted and corrupted. As we said before, and we, say, we keep saying many, many times, it's important for us to understand history. If you don't understand history, and you don't understand why and how a particular belief or a particular statement arose in what circumstances and in response to what, we will not really truly understand our belief and our creed. And even more importantly, we will not understand what opposes it from those who, you know, from, from, from the sayings and the statements of the, the deviants and the innovators. So, uh, the, the understanding of these texts of the Salaf is the most knowledgeable and the most precise. It is free from any corruption. And so the principle that we adhere to and which they adhere to is that Allah is described with whatever He described Himself with and whatever His Messenger described Him him with. And likewise with whatever As-Sabiqoon, Al-Awwaloon, the very first generation of Muslims, whatever they described Allah with. And we do not go beyond the Qur'an and the Hadith in this regard. Shaykh al-Islam, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, وَمَذْهَبُ السَّلَفِ أَنَّهُمْ يَصِفُونَ اللَّهَ بِمَا وَصَفَ بِهِ نَفْسَهُ وَبِمَا وَصَفَ وَصَفَهُ بِهِ رَسُولُهُ مِنْ غَيْرِ تَحْرِيفٍ وَلَا تَعْطِيلٍ وَمِنْ غَيْرِ تَقْيِيفٍ وَلَا تَمْثِيلٍ وَنَعْلَمُ أَنَّمَا وَصَفَ اللَّهُ بِهِ مِنْ ذَلِكَ فَهُوَ حَقٌ So he says the way of the Salaf is that they describe Allah with whatever he described himself and with whatever his messenger described him without doing tahrif. Now again, I want you to relate this to what we said in the poetry. In the poetry, we say, وَأَسُونُهَا أَنْ كُلِّ مَا يُتَخَيَّلُ That we protect everything which is narrated and transmitted as it relates to the attributes from everything which is, from, which, which is imagined. So here this principle is an explanation of what is being mentioned here. That we, we are supposed to protect that which we find in these narrations from what and how? And what, what is the method? And here is the method. We don't make any tahrif. We don't make any tahrif. Tahrif means distortion, to change. Nor do we make ta'atil. Ta'atil means to deny. Nor do we make takyif. Takyif means to ask how. And nor do we make tamthil. Tamthil means to make a likeness, set up a likeness for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know that whatever Allah described himself with, then that is indeed the truth. So now we want to explain 
each of these four things in a bit more detail at tahrif and likewise ta'til and takif and tamthil so as for the first at tahrif this is the first thing that we protect our belief in the attributes of Allah from so the first thing is at tahrif at tahrif the meaning of tahrif means to turn something to the side and it means to change and to alter and there are some definitions here from some of the uh, scholars of the language uh, al-azhari he says quoting al-layf he says at-tahrif fi al-qur'an taghyiru al-kalima an ma'naha which means that to, the tahrif in the quran means to change a word from its meaning to change a word from its meaning and which is he and he says that this is the way of the jews the jews used to change the meanings of the torah by finding other similar meanings and so they would start distorting the the, the, the torah in order to change the meanings which 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 are found therein now this tahrif this tahrif the it is of two types the first type of tahrif the first type of distortion is the tahrif lafzi tahrif lafzi where you actually cha- physically change the word you make a change in the word and the second change is the tahrif ma'nawi tahrif ma'nawi the tahrif in the meaning where you change the actual meaning now let me give you an example of the first one an example of where the changing is in uh, wording and this can be done why by either adding a letter or taking away a letter or changing a vowel on a letter in a word and an example of this is when the jahmiya the jahmiya those who deny that allah has the attribute of speech when they said regarding the ayah in the quran wa kallama allah Musa taklima wa kallam Allahu Musa taklima this ayah means and Allah spoke to Moses direct wa kallam Allahu you see the 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 the, the vowel at the end of Allah is a dhamma and dhamma means raf means it is in the nominative case which means that Allah is the one who is doing the action which is the speaking wa kallam Allahu Musa taklima so what they said is that they distorted this verse by changing the voweling they said wa kallam allah wa kallam allah they changed the dhamma to a fatha and so this now means that allah is the one being spoken to wa kallam allah musa and musa is the one speaking and so in this way they distorted the quran and they uh, and this was to fit in with their innovation that allah does not speak and does not have the attribute of speech but then we find in another ayah in the quran allah subhanahu subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa kallamahu rabbahu rabbuhu wa kallamahu rabbuhu and his lord spoke to moses which again is is a refutation of the of their distortion of the the other verse so anyway the point being that this is one of the ways that they distort the the, the words in the quran another way is to add a letter so we see the jahmiya when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he said ar-rahman ala al-arsh istawa they changed this and they said this means istawla this is the mu'tazila istawla it means they added the lam they added the lam it means uh, that uh, that uh, that allah conquered he didn't arise over the throne but he conquered the throne so they added the lam from from istawa to istawla and so the meaning is he conquered and that's why in some poetry uh, that is uh, mentioned by Sheikh al-Islam and others they say no one al-yahud wa lam al-jahmi no one al-yahud wa lam al-jahmi which means that the jews they added a noon they added a noon and the jahmiya they added a lam the jews they were ordered uh, when they were given certain uh, food and they 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 were they were given a certain word and they added a noon to the word they wanted a food other than the food that they were they were being given and so the point being from this is that this way of distorting the book of allah is from the traits and the ways of the of the yahud of the jews this is their way allah establishes this about them allah says yuharrifun al-kalima an muwadi'ih 
that they are the ones who distort and change the words from their proper places. That's what they used to do with the Torah. And this was inherited in this Ummah by the Jahmiya and whoever followed their way in distorting. And likewise the Rafida, the Shia, whoever followed their way in distorting the, the Quran and the verses of Allah. And as for the second type of tahrif, so this, is, this was the first type of tahrif, the second type of tahrif is when they take the word away from its proper meaning. They don't distort the word, but then they take it away from its proper meaning. So for example, uh, we might have the, the, the attribute of Allah, as samar which is hearing, and al-basar, which is seeing. And we see that some of the, 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 the Ash'aris and Maturidis, they claim uh, that this means knowledge. As summer hearing is actually knowledge. Al Basar is actually knowledge. Right? This is this is the way of the of the later Ash'aris and the later Maturidis. Right? And the reason why they were forced to distort even the because remember these these two attributes are supposed to be from the seven that they allegedly affirm. Right? But in reality, the only thing they really affirm in, in reality is really that there is, is Allah's life. But the other six it's not really possible for them to affirm. Uh, and be consistent with their principles, right? So this is an example where they don't distort these words in the Quran: as sama wal basar, as sami wal basir. They don't distort. They don't change the actual wording, but they distort the meaning. They say as sama means knowledge, and al basar means knowledge. The reason why they say this is because is because if Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is able to see things with vision, with sight. And Allah is able to hear things with actual hearing. That means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He didn't create the creation, the creation wasn't there for Him to see. And then when He created the creation, He could see the creation. This to the Jahmiya and the Mu'tazila and the Ash'ariya and the Maturidiya is what they call Hawadith. It means that something has changed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah is not subject to change. Right? This is a principle they've taken from Aristotle, straight from his books and his, his, his philosophy. Okay, so, so on that basis, if you, if you affirm Allah hears and sees, it is implied within that that Allah sees, for example, Allah saw the creation after the creation wasn't created. It, 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 it just makes sense. And Allah hears, Allah hears the speech of the creation before they, before they weren't speaking, right? So to them, this means, this implies changes in Allah's essence, right? And on that basis, they denied what is in the Quran, what is in the Sunnah. But the Ash'aris and Maturidis didn't come out outright and say outright, Allah doesn't hear, Allah doesn't see, like the Jahmiya. Jahmiya and the Mu'tazila are very straight and very honest, and they will say, we deny all attributes, right? So they are very consistent in their principles, they are consistent in their denial. As for the Ash'aris, they play word games. And the Maturidis, they play word games. right? They actually deny the attribute. And then they try to play games to make it look as if they affirm the attribute. So all of their arguments are just plays and trickery with words, with definitions and so on and so forth. right? So if you look in the books of the later Ash'aris and Maturidis, they say hearing is not actual hearing, it means ilm. And seeing is not actual seeing, vision, it is ilm. So, as-sam' wal-basar, they've actually denied and referred back to the other knowledge of ilm, of ilm, right? So, uh, the, the point being here that the second way of distortion of tahrif is if you don't distort the words by adding a vowel, adding a letter, taking away a letter, you know, that you actually start distorting the meaning of that attribute. Now, hearing now means knowledge. As we know, hearing is not the same as knowledge. Hearing is hearing. Hearing is a is a separate attribute with its own meaning. And likewise with vision, with sight. It's a separate attribute with its own separate meaning. And that's why if you were to, in your mind, if you think of these three meanings, vision, hearing, and sight, there are three separate meanings in your mind. There are three separate meanings in, in, in your mind. So anyway, this is the uh, tahrif. And so we protect our belief from tahrif, whether it is tahrif in wording or tahrif in in meaning. You said the first word is called manawi. Uh, uh, first is tahrif lafzi, oh. tahrif lafzi, 
A tahrif in wording. And the second one is tahrif ma'nawi. Tahrif ma'nawi. Tahrif in meaning. The second thing that we protect our belief and these narrations is a ta'atil. A ta'atil, the meaning of ta'atil is explained by another word in the Arabic language. It means a tafriq. A tafriq. And the way to explain this would be that if we were to, say for example, this room, we were to remove every single thing from it, we were to leave this room, we were to strip every single item, the lights, every single item, the carpet, so it's just completely and utterly bare. This is the meaning of ta'atil. It means vacating and emptying. Right? This is the meaning of this word in the Arabic uh, language. And that's why we have a phrase, وَأَطَّلَ dar akhlaha. That he, that he vacated the, the, the house, meaning he emptied it and he left it. And so this ta'atil that we are speaking of, there are, there are two types of it. There are uh, two types. The first type is what we call ta'atilun mahdun or at ta'atil al-kulli al-am. This means a complete, total negation. A complete, total emptying. And what this refers to, as Shaykh Islam explains, that this is referring to the atheists. The atheists and the naturalists, those people today who, who believe that there is only time and there is only the, the natural world, as they say. These are the people who have made ta'atil of the creation they, 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 they've, they've denied that there is a creator for the creation. So in other words, they've made ta'atil for the creation of a creator. right? They've, they've stripped and removed from the creation of having a creator. This is the general universal type of ta'atil, pure ta'atil, meaning there is, no, there is no Lord, there is no creator, there is no maker, there is no originator. There is just matter and there is just time. Ah, and time just transpires and it you know destroys and whatever and that's all there is and so these people this is what this is this first type of ta'til it is pure ta'til and they say the only thing that exists is what we observe with the senses what we can see from the universe and what we see this is the only thing that that really exists so this is pure ta'til and of course this is from the greatest falsehood and there are many ways that this can be refuted. Uh, I mean, uh, just just very briefly, the, the, the first principle is that, you know, uh, do there exist things? The first question that you ask is, do there exist things which the senses cannot perceive? And if they say yes, well, obviously, then that principle is false because that, that now allows the possibility of that which is besides and other than the universe and the creation. And if you say no... That's the greatest of falsehood because then you 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 denying uh, the very foundation of your own of your own knowledge and your science, you know. Because if you say that no, there isn't anything noble outside of the five senses, that, that's just clear falsehood. Because obviously you you with, with telescopes and microscopes and whatever else and you know the theoretical particles that you haven't even ever seen, but on the basis of which you you know build uh, theories and whatever else, you know. You, so th this shows that th this, this is false. It's 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 badly. It's false. But anyway, that's that's a, a side issue. We don't uh, you know uh, divulge away from 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 that, divert away from that. So anyway, coming back to the issue, that's the first type of ta'atil, pure ta'atil, denying a creator outright. This is the way of the atheists, philosophers, naturalists, and other than them. The second type of ta'atil is, um, in fact, before we go to the second type, there's a statement from Ibn Al Qayyim. And Ibn al Qayyim he says, uh, he says, Wa ahlu ta'atil al mahd. The people of pure negation. They have attalu al shara'i. They have negated the legislations, meaning that the revelations that Allah sent. So to them, there's no such thing as revelation. Revelation doesn't exist. Well, and books from Allah, there, there are no books because there's no creator. So how can there be revelation? Right? So this is the first thing that they deny. So clearly that means to them, prophethood is not real either. Prophethood isn't real. Rather, these just men, these are just men who invented things. They had they were very intelligent, 
They had powerful imaginations, they invented things, and they just, you know, invented morals and principles and they wanted the people to, you know, to be to be guided or whatever else. So, first thing they did is Attalu Ashara'i. They denied revelations. And then he said, Wa attalu wa attalu al Masnu' anisani. And they denied a maker for that which is made, for that which is created. Denied that there is a maker. And then he says, Wa attalu asani an sifatil kamal. And also they denied from the maker his attributes. Right? This is also the way of some of these philosophers. They say Allah is just merely, or the Creator is just a mere abstract meaning in the mind. It's just an idea in the mind. He doesn't have any attributes. We can't say he exists, he has knowledge, he has hearing, his life. And as you know, that anything which does not have an attribute doesn't exist. Anything which does not have at least one attribute doesn't exist. It's a non-existing thing. That's, that's just a, a, a firm principle. That if you say something exists without any attribute, that is false. That is false. It means that it's, you, you know, it doesn't actually exist in reality. And then he says, وَأَطَّلُوا الْعَالَمْ أَنِ الْحَقَّ الَّذِي خُلِقَ لَهُ وَبِهِ and he says, and they also denied and negated for the universe that it has a truth and an objective for which it was created. Right? This is also one of the ways of these atheists and naturalists and materialists. They say the universe doesn't actually have any purpose. Right? So they, they, they made ta'teel for the universe of its reason and purpose and objective of being created. Uh, and so anyway, this is a statement of uh, Ibn Qayyim as well. But coming now to the second type of ta'til, this is the ta'til juz'i. This is the partial partial ta'til. And this ta'til, in respect to this, there are four different groups and factions. There are four factions and groups who fall into this ta'til. And all of these ascribe to Islam. They ascribe to Islam. So the first of them, who make this ta'til are those are the, are, the, are, the, are the ones who make the least ta'til they are the ash'aris and maturidis ash'aris and maturidis and they basically affirm only uh, seven attributes or seven attributes and some others on top of that and this is knowledge and hearing and seeing and power and wish or will and speech and hearing and seeing but really they don't really truly affirm any of these attributes except for maybe one which is life life all the rest they can't really affirm without being true to their principles without being true to their principles that's a different different discussion so this is the first group so they make ta'til of everything else they don't believe allah has actions they don't believe allah has actions and they don't believe um that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the other attributes, the sifat, khabariyya. They don't believe Allah has hikmah, wisdom. They don't believe Allah has mercy, rahmah. They explain all of these attributes away. The only seven is the, the seven which I mentioned. And again, that's on the basis of reason and intellect, not because of revelation. After them, we have the Mu'tazila. The Mu'tazila. The Mu'tazila, they deny all of the attributes. They deny all of the attributes. And likewise, they deny the names in reality, but they affirm them only metaphorically. They say, yeah, we affirm the names, uh, but really, they say that every name is just the same in meaning. Al-Alim means the same as Ar-Rahim, means the same as As-Sami, which means the same as Al-Basir. All of these just simply point to Allah. They don't have separate meanings. So really, you haven't really affirmed the names of Allah. You just said you just affirm them as mere labels that point to a thing or a being. We haven't affirmed that Allah is actually as sami hearing and al alim and ar rahim and so on and so forth. This is the ashar. This is the mu'tazila. They deny all of the attributes and they pretend to affirm the names. They pretend to affirm the names. And then we have the jahmiya, the extremist jahmiya, who are the third level now, and they deny everything, the names and the attributes, and they will not describe Allah with any positive attribute, right? They, they, they will only describe Allah with negatives, right? with negatives. This is, there are many factions amongst them, but some of them they will only describe Allah with negatives. Allah is not 
Allah is not unjust. They won't say Allah is just. They won't make a positive affirmation. They will say Allah is not blind. They won't say Allah is, Allah is seeing. Because that means affirming an attribute for Allah. They will not say Allah is, they will say Allah is not ignorant. They will not say Allah is all knowing. Right? So they will not affirm an attribute. They will just make negations and denials. Right? Now this thing here is one of the general features of the creed of all of the people of Kalam. All of the Ahlul Kalam, Jahmiya, Mu'tazila, Ash'ariya, Maturidiya, all of them, they have this as a general trait as to how they describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They took it from the non-Muslim nations. Non-Muslim nations. This is not what the Qur'an came with. The Qur'an came with specifically affirming attributes. Allah has ilm, Allah has knowledge, mercy, Allah has forgiveness, Allah has will, and so on and so forth. Allah came with specific mention of specific attributes. As for negating, it came only in a general sense. There is no likeness to Allah. There is no resemblance to Allah. There is no rival to Allah. There is no equal to Allah. And then there are specific things that Allah negates because of a reason. Allah denies He has a son because the Christians claim He has a son. Allah denies His hands are tied because the Jews claim His hands are, are, are tied. Allah denies He is oppressive and unjust to His servants. Right? Allah denies specific things. But outside of those specific things, Allah denies things in general. We do not find in the Quran Allah saying, you know, Allah is not ignorant, Allah is not blind, Allah is not deaf, Allah is not this, Allah is not that. Because this doesn't involve any praise. If you to say Allah is all knowing, is this more praiseworthy or is it more praiseworthy to say Allah is not ignorant? We can see clearly that this is not the language of the of the Quran. So anyway, this was the way of the Jahmiyyah, the third group, the Jahmiyyah, to describe Allah with negatives. In negatives only, to avoid affirming an attribute. Then the fourth group are those people who ascribe to Islam. They are the philosophers, people like Ibn Sina and Al Farabi, and those people, and they denied everything for Allah until even they said you can't even describe Him with negatives. So you can't say Allah is all knowing, nor can you say Allah is not ignorant. Right? So you can't you so this shows another level of, of, of misguidance of these people. And they even said you can't say Allah exists and Allah does not exist. You can't make these affirmations or negations. Anyway, this is the fourth level. So all of these four groups, the Ash'aris and Maturidis at the first level, then the Mu'tazila, then the Jahmiya, and then the Falasifa, the, the philosophers. Right? These are the four levels of Ta'til, and they increase in Ta'til as we move further back and back and back. From the Ash'aris and Maturidis, then to the Mu'tazila, then to the Jahmiya, then to the, the Falasifa, the, the, the philosophers. So, this is the third thing that we protect ourselves from, At-Ta'atil. At -ta'atil. The third and fourth was At-Tamthil, At-Tamthil, and then Takif. As for Tamthil, Tamthil means to liken the attributes of Allah with those of His creation. This again, is its roots lie in the Jews, the Yahud. The Yahud, they are the ones who in whose in who when you look into their belief and in their history, they are the ones who made this tamthil and this tashbih for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We see that they would describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with many repugnant and evil things from the traits of the creation. They described him with Al Ajaz, Allah being uncapable. They described him with Al Fakr. Poverty, Allah is, Allah, Allah, Allah is poor and needy. They described him with al-bukhl, Allah is miserly. All of these are traits which are only found in, 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 in the creation. And they described him with these evil types of repugnant uh, descriptions. And so the asal, the foundation of uh, tashbih and tamthil lies with the Yahud. And then in this ummah it lies with the Rafida, with the Rafida Shia. Because they are simply an extension of the of the Yahud in any case. So the Rafid the Shia, they are the ones who began to, uh, uh, you know, raise the Imams. They claimed Ali is Allah Himself, and they had many of the Imams that they claimed were a manifestation of Allah upon this earth. And so they ascribed to Allah limbs, and some of them went and some of them went as far as to say that Allah that He has flesh and blood. 
na'udhu billahi min dhalik. Right, so this, this tamthil and tashbih is something that originates with the Yahud, and it was in this ummah, it was, it was originated by the Rafida, the Rafida uh, Shia. And so, no doubt, this is prohibited and forbidden. And as for at takyif the fourth thing, at takyif is to ask, how is Allah's attribute? How is Allah's knowledge? How is Allah seeing? How is Allah's seeing, uh, hearing? How is Allah's mercy? How is Allah's anger? How is Allah's face? How is to ask all these questions? This is takyif, and this is also prohibited. So, when we read in this poetry, wa asunuha an kullima yutakhayyalu, that I protect what has been transmitted in the sunnah of narrations which mention the attributes of Allah, then what is the way that we protect that transmission? It is by avoiding these uh, four things. Now, this is what we find uh, as a general principle of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. But then we find that there is another element here when we go back to the narrations from the Salaf. And we can find that this line of poetry can be explained in a different way as well. Okay, so what we've done here in the lesson so far is that we've explained this line of poetry by way of the well-known principle that we find in the books of Shaykh al-Islam that we affirm for Allah what he affirmed for himself or his messenger affirmed for him and we negate from, from him whatever he denied for himself and whatever his message denied from him without tahrif and ta'til and takyif and tamthil. Right? This is one way to interpret and explain this line of poetry. Now there's another way to explain this line of poetry which is found in the kalam of the salaf of the second century after Hijra. And this is explained in the following statement. I'll just make the statement and the rest of the lesson will be an elaboration of this statement. So the statement is Amiruha Kama Ja'at. Amiruha Kama Ja'at. Bila Kaif. Bila Kaif. Wala Ma'na. Wala Tafsir. Wala Had. Wala Wasf. Wala Gaya. Okay, so many, many statements. Let me explain this in English. In English, this means pass them on, pass them on, meaning pass on these narrations that have come regarding Allah's attributes, pass them on, just as they have come, exactly as they have come, without, without, kaif, asking how, without asking how, without ma'na, without giving a meaning that the text didn't come with, without tafsir, without giving an explanation beyond what is already clear in the text. Without had, had, without had meaning without giving a definition that is not come in the text itself. And without uh, tafsir. Okay, so this sentence which I've mentioned to you, this is what we find in the speech of the Salaf in the second century after Hijrah. We see many of their statements which combined they give us this general statement. Amiruha kama ja'at. Pass them on exactly as they have come. Bila kaif. Without how? Bila kaif wala ma'na. Without bringing a meaning. Wala tafsir. Without any explanation from yourself. Wala had. Without any other definition from yourself. Right? These were statements that were being made in the second century after Hijrah. And so this really then for us is an interpretation or an explanation of what has been mentioned here by Shaykh al-Islam, وَأَسُونُهَا عَنْ كُلِّ مَا يُتَّخَيِّلُ That I protect my belief in these narrations and what they contain from everything that can be imagined. Right? Imagined by asking how, kayf. Imagined by giving a meaning from yourself, ma'na. Imagined by start giving explanations to these texts, with tafsir. Imagined by starting giving definitions, had or hudud. So, so let's read some speech from the Salaf where this principle is contained. So first of all, we have from uh, Imam Al-Awza'i, rahimahullah ta'ala. He's narrating from Makhul. Also pay attention to the dates of death of these Imams. 
Makhul died 113 Hijrah. Makhul. He also narrates from Az Zuhri. Az Zuhri died 124 Hijrah. He said, they were asked about the explanation of the ahadith that mention Allah's attributes. And they said, Amir Ruha kama ja'at. Amir Ruha kama ja'at. Pass them on as they have come. Pass them on as they have come. Next we have Al-Walid bin Muslim and he's narrating from Imam Al-Awza'i. Imam Al-Awza'i died 157 Hijra. And Sufyan al thawri 167 Hijra. Malik bin, uh, bin Anas, 179 Hijra. And Al-Layth bin Sa'ad, 175 Hijra. I ask these four Imams about these ahadith in which Seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioned. Seeing Allah in the hereafter. And they said, Amir Ruha kama ja'at bila kayf. Amir Ruha bila kayf. Pass them on exactly as they have come without asking how. Without asking how. So the key thing is, notice the dates of death of these Imams. All of these are in the second century after Hijrah. So the question arises, who are these Imams, who are they refuting? Who are they refuting? Right? This is crucial for us to understand, I mentioned in a previous lesson as well, that we have to really get a grasp on history and historical fact. Because if we don't, it will allow these people who are present today, the Ash'aris and Maturidis, who are really the inheritors of the Jahmiyyah, they will start playing games of deception. Right? And they actually use these statements from these Imams to try to justify one of their viewpoints, which is tafweed. Tafweed means that these words have come, yes, we believe in these words that they are in the Quran, but we don't know what the meanings are. We don't know what the meaning of istiwa really is. We don't know what the meaning of wajh face really is. These are things which whose, whose meaning only Allah knows. And then they say that our proof for this, that this is what the Salaf were upon, is these statements right here. Amir Ruha kama ja'at bila kayf. Pass them on as they have come, without asking how. And so then they will try to make it appear to you as if the Salaf, when they read these words in the Qur'an, they didn't mean anything to them. It was just like as if someone who doesn't know Russian, he picks up a Russian sentence, and the, meaning, the, the sentence is absolutely meaningless to him. There's no meaning in that sentence for him because he doesn't understand what Russian is. So they're trying to say to us that this is what the Salaf, this is what the Salaf, this is how it was to the Salaf. They said, pass them on as they have come. Meaning, these words, they have no meanings, we don't know what they are, just pass them on and, you know, that's it. Right? So how do we refute this false claim? We refute it by knowing history. History tells us that these statements made, first of all, who made these, who made these statements? Amir Ruha kama ja'at bila kayf wala ma'na wala tafsir wala had who made these statements Imam Malik Az Zuhri Al Awza'i which century did they live in their death dates they lived in the second century after Hijrah who was present in that time who were the who were the people who were being refuted the Jahmiya and the Mu'tazila why were they refuting the Jahmiya and the Mu'tazila what was the reason because the Jahmiya and the Mu'tazila started bringing their ta'wils, their interpretations, their the new had, the new tafsir, the new ma'na, uh, the new the, the the new kaif. Right? So they started saying uh, uh, Allah's istawa means istawla. Allah's uh, you know uh, uh, this attribute means such and such. This means such and such, right? They began to interpret away all of the different attributes. When this began to happen, this is when the Imams of the Salaf said Pass these texts on, leave them intact, don't mess with them, don't play around with them, don't distort them, don't make tafsir of them, don't ask how, don't, don't give a new meaning, don't give a new definition, pass it on exactly as it has come. Right? This was what, what was really taking place in the second century after, after Hijrah. So these statements should be understood in light of this. I say this because there are people today, you see there are books being published, there's a book whole books being published and there are people like Al-Qaradawi and other, other innovators and deviants who will claim and they will write books and they will claim that the way of the Salaf was to make tafweed meaning was to read the text and claim ignorance of what it means 
And then they will use these statements that we're reading now as a justification for this particular uh, position or doctrine. And all of this, as we as we read through, read through, read through the uh, as we read through the statements made, we we'll see that is clearly clearly uh, false. Let's read another narration, and this is let's find another suitable narration. And uh, the statement here is from. Okay, let's read this narration first. This is from Muhammad bin Al Makhlad. Narrated, and there's a chain of narration, and it goes all the way back to Al Qasim bin Salam. Al Qasim bin Salam is one of the Imams of the third century. He wrote a book, Kitab al Iman, and he came prior to Imam Ahmed. And he says that those ahadith, those ahadith which mention seeing Allah in the hereafter, and the kursi, and other attributes like the laughter of our Lord, and the and 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 uh, and and then there are, he mentions many other hadith which which contain some of these attributes. He says these are hadith are authentic. They are authentic. The people of hadith and the jurists, the fuqaha, they narrated them from each other in transmission, and in our view they are true. We do not doubt about them. However, when it is said, how when it is said, kaif how. And how does Allah do this? And how does Allah do this? We say that is not to be explained. La yufassar. That is not to be explained. We have not heard anyone explain this. We do not, you know, we don't, we don't make explanations beyond what is in the text itself. Another statement is here from uh, the Imam of the Sunnah, Imam Ahmed. And we see in his book, Usul al-Sunnah, now this again is an important thing to understand. Imam Ahmed, he mentions the hadith of intercession. And in this hadith, we in the hadith where a people will be taken out of the fire after they've been burned and turned to coal, and they will be ordered to enter into a river by a gate near paradise. And this is what is mentioned in, in the narration. So Imam Ahmed is saying, we believe in this as has come in the narration. Kama ja'at, kama ja'at fil, fil, fil athar. As has come in the narration. And then he brings some other hadith as well. He brings the hadith of the hypocrisy. There are three characteristics which if found in a person, he is a hypocrite. Right? The one When he speaks, he lies. When he's trusted, he breaks his trust. When he, you know, the, 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 the hadith. He says about this hadith, we report them just as they have come. And we do not explain them. Right. Now, what, what, what is the significance of this point here? You have to really understand what's going on here. You see, those ahadith that we mentioned before, the ahadith of the attributes, right? The ahadith which Allah's mentioned Allah's attributes, Allah being seen in the hereafter, Allah's laughter at, at, at two men, you know, both, one of whom kills the other, but both go to paradise. Allah being amazed, and all those attributes which, which come in the, 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 the sunnah, right? We see that the salaf said about them, Amiruha kama ja'at. Pass them on exactly as they have come, right? We see, however, there are other ahadith in the sunnah as well, besides those which mention the attributes, with respect to which these imams also made a similar statement. Pass them on exactly as they have come. So we see the ahadith of the signs of hypocrisy. Right? They said, leave this hadith as it is. We don't explain this hadith. Leave it as, as it is because it has come upon taghleev. Taghleev means that this hadith has come as a way of being severe in order to people make to, to, to make the people flee from these traits and characteristics. Don't start explaining this hadith or it means this means just leave it exactly as it is. Don't don't give any explanations. Right? And likewise, the hadith of people you know, who were burnt to, to, to charcoal and they get taken out. And there are other hadith which are like this, uh, that other scholars, they said uh, the same thing. Uh, Ali, Ali bin al-Madini, one of the teachers of Imam uh, al-Bukhari, he said, he says, likewise, the hadith do not become disbelievers after me, striking the necks of each other. And like, likewise, the hadith, when two Muslims meet with their swords, then both the killer and the killed are in the fire. 
And likewise the hadith, cursing a Muslim is wickedness and fighting against him is disbelief. And likewise the hadith, whoever says to his brother, kafir, then it returns, to back, to, then it returns back upon one of them. And so he mentions all these hadith which mention kufr. He says, we do not explain, la nufassiru, these hadith, except upon what they have come with. Right? So again, he's using the same remark. Uh, we pass them on as they have come. We don't explain them. Right? Now, what is the point in mentioning all of this? The point in mentioning all of this is, look at how the salaf, they use the same speech, amir ruha kama ja'at, pass them on as they have come, without tafsir, without ma'na. For these are hadith which have nothing to do with the attributes. They've got nothing to do with the attributes of Allah. The hadith mentioning hypocrisy. The hadith mentioning kufr. And other type, other type of hadith. Right? So the lesson and the point from this is, is the following. That clearly the salaf, they understood what these ahadith meant. Right? When the messenger says, three are the characteristics of hypocrisy, whoever has them, he is a hypocrite. When he speaks, he tells a lie. When he is trusted, he breaks his trust. And when he makes a covenant, he acts treacherously. Do you understand the meaning of what has just been said? Of course you understand the meaning of what has just been said. Of course you understand the meaning. Right? However, the Salaf said, pass them on as they have come. Don't start explaining these ahadith. Right? In the same way, when, when we find in the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu that Allah, that Allah, you know, that, that, that Allah laughs at two men, or Allah is amazed at the, at, at, at the state of a, a, at a believer, and the other ahadith which mention these attributes, when the Salaf said, pass them on as they have come, then they clearly understand the meaning. Right? That we affirm the attribute for Allah, we affirm that Allah is amazed, we affirm that Allah laughs, we affirm that Allah becomes angry, we affirm these attributes, we do not know how they are. We don't give any other further explanation, we don't give any tafsir or whatever from ourselves, we affirm the meaning. So this is another point, uh, or another discussion in fact, that when we go back to the Salaf and we investigate what were the remarks that they were making in the second century after Hijrah? And who the, were they speaking to? The Jahmi and the Mu'tazila. This again helps us to understand the intent behind this statement. وَأَسُونُهَا أَنْ كُلِّ مَا يُتَخَيَّلُ That I protect my belief and these narrations and what they contain from everything that can be imagined. Meaning, everything that is beyond the meaning which has come in the text itself. Beyond the meaning which has come in the text itself. So in the Qur'an, when we read Allah hears and Allah sees, clearly we know the meaning of this. We know what it means that Allah has knowledge. We know what it means that Allah hears and sees. We know what the meaning of that is. But do we know how Allah hears and sees? Do we know how Allah has His knowledge? No, we don't know that. And the, the mind cannot know that. And so this is where this principle comes in, that we, be, we, we pass them on as they have come, without kayf, asking how, without tafsir, without explanation, without had, without definition, without uh, ma'ana, without any other meaning. This is how we really understand what the Salaf was saying in the second century after Hijrah. So this brings us to an end to this specific line of poetry. And if you want further information on this, or if you want to read some of the uh, narrations, I have an article here which is really 16 pages long. I didn't have time to read everything. But you can find this article on uh, asharis.com. Uh, there's an article which addresses this argument of the asharis and maturidis. It is, it is called, it is called uh, uh, tafweed, tafweed and pass them on as they have come without tafsir, ma'na, kayf and had. You can find this article on asharis.com and it will give you all of the translations and the statements from the Salaf in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century, uh, to explain what they really meant by uh, this uh, principle, which also helps us to explain the statement of uh, Shaykh al-Islam in, in our lesson today. So with that we conclude our lesson, and this really ends our discussion of uh, the 5th, uh, sorry, the 6th, 7th and 8th lines in this poetry because all of these lines were connected to the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the previous five or six or seven lessons however many there were we've established 
the general principles of Ahlul Sunnah as it relates to speaking about Allah, His names, His attributes and actions, and how that differs from the Ahlul Kalam, the people of misguidance. And this leads us now to one of the greatest issues uh, to uh, arise in this Ummah in the issues of belief, which is the issue of the Qur'an, the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and specifically the arguments of the Ash'aris and the Maturidis. And so this is the next statement in the poetry. Qubhan, Qubhan, liman nabadha al-Qur'ana wara'ahu. Woe be to, or disgrace be to the one who threw the Qur'an behind his back. وَإِذَا اسْتَدَلَّ يَقُولُ قَالَ الْأَخْطَلُ And when he seeks evidence for his saying, he says, Al-Akhtal said. And Al-Akhtal is the name of a Trinitarian Christian. A Trinitarian Christian. Because the Ash'aris, when you ask them what is Kalam in Arabic, they won't say to you, Allah said, and the Messenger said, and the Salaf said. They will say, Al-Akhtal said. Al-Akhtal is a Trinitarian Christian. And on some alleged piece of poetry that he allegedly wrote, they base their doctrine regarding the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is something that we will elaborate upon inshallah ta'ala in the next lesson. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.